Welcome everyone. It's a great delight to be able to be here today and to share with you at this marvellous event. You know, what we believe about the past is tremendously important in shaping how we see ourselves, how we see other people and how we relate to them. So this issue of what we believe about the past is fundamental to what we might call our world view. So I've chosen a title here with two key words in it and those words are but true. So how can I say that my history of time is the true history of time? It sounds a little arrogant, doesn't it? But I can say it because the history of time I'm going to share with you this afternoon to paint the big picture of this issue is based on this book, God's Word, the Bible. And I want to take you on something of a journey through the opening chapters of this book and to unpack for you what actually happened in the past. And by the way, I promise that this won't take millions of years. But <laughs> firstly, let me tell you something a little more about what I have done for some 30 years professionally. And uh, I know that you'd be shocked to learn that I've worked for 30 years at anything professionally. I look far too young for that. Thank you for the, uh, the affirmation. But I've worked in the, the field, the aerospace industry, in satellite communications. And uh, you've all seen those little grey dishes on rooftops, all pointing up to the sky. Has anyone got one of those at home or you've seen them? They're pointing to one of the Optus satellites which carry direct-to-home television throughout Australia. And I've had the privilege of being involved directly in the design of those communication satellites um, as I've said, over the past few decades. Now, these machines are very expensive. That particular one on the screen, the Optus C1 satellite, cost around $500 million to design, construct, launch and operate. Now, that's a substantial sum of money in anybody's thinking. And a commercial organisation like Optus will not make an investment in something like that unless they are confident that it will actually work when it's placed into service. So not surprisingly, in the construction phase of a communication satellite, there's a very extensive testing program which is designed to ensure that the spacecraft works in accordance with its specifications in every respect prior to launch. You see, when it's up there, it can't be reached to affect repairs. So the kind of science that I've been involved in is what you might call experimental or operational science. It's the kind of science that leads to all the wonderful technological advancements that we enjoy in our community today. Now, operational or experimental science is based on observable and repeatable experiments. And let me give you an example of what I mean by that. If I were to take these keys and throw them in the air and say that I'm demonstrating one of the laws of physics, what law of physics would it be? Gravity, that's right. Someone suggested you're just demonstrating you own a car, but that wasn't really the point. <laughs> now, if I had the right equipment, I could conduct a series of experiments to determine the universal gravitational constant G. And for that purpose, it wouldn't matter whether I was a Christian or an atheist or what I believed. And the reason it wouldn't matter is because I would be performing observable, repeatable experiments. In principle, at least, Anybody could do that. But there's another kind of science that we hear a lot about, and it's what we might call historical or forensic science. Now, in this kind of science, the scientist is looking at evidence in the present, and he's trying to understand what happened in the past to lead to what he's observing in the present. Now, this is always a challenge, but what is interesting is that the moment you make up a story about the past you invoke your belief systems about the past. So in this case, our friend is looking at a fossil in a rock and he's imagining what might have happened in the past to lead to this animal ending up in the rock. So if he believes that the universe made itself through unguided processes over billions and billions of years, the process we call evolution, that process of, of progress from molecules to man, without any form of guidance or supernatural intervention, then the story he makes up about the past will reflect his belief. If, however, 
he believes that there was a creator God, then he would make up a very different story about the past to explain that fossil. You see, the problem is science only works in the present. Remember, it was based on observable, repeatable experiments. Let me give you an example of, of how science is limited. If I were to ask you, can you think of an experiment that you could perform to determine when World War II started? There's no such experiment, is there? You see, it's not a matter for science. That is a matter for history. So only history can reveal the past. So what we really need to understand what actually happened in our origins is an eyewitness, someone who knows everything, who obviously was there, who loves us, who wouldn't deceive us, and who has written down for us all we need to know about the past. And my friends, we have exactly that here recorded in this book, God's Word, the Bible. Now, I believe that this is God's word. That's a faith statement, but it's a reasonable faith statement, as I trust you will see as we progress through this talk. You see, God so acted on the human authors of this book that they wrote only what was in accordance with his purposes and without any error. For that reason, I can place my entire confidence on what it plainly teaches me. It's interesting, too, that attacks on Christianity today are almost invariably attacks on the Bible, particularly on its authority and its authenticity. So, if what the Bible says in the opening chapters, the most foundational part where God reveals to himself that he is our creator, if those chapters can be proved wrong, the entire fabric of our faith falls apart. And there would be no basis on which to trust the Bible in any other area. So let's go on this journey through time and we'll open up this book and see what it says. And the very first thing we read is this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What a majestic statement that is. But it stands in stark contrast with everything that we are taught through our education system, through primary, secondary, university. You turn the television on, look at a documentary, and before long you'll be told that we descended from the apes or that we're millions and millions of years old or whatever. This process of unguided random events called evolution. You see, such a belief strikes at the very basis of God's revelation of himself to mankind, his revelation through his word, the Bible, that he is indeed the creator. You see, we have sort of two choices, really. Either the universe made itself or... Someone made it, and that fundamentally is the choice we have. Well, as we turn through the pages of this first chapter of Genesis, we discover that God tells us he created everything in the universe in just six ordinary earth days. That is a staggering statement, isn't it? It boggles the mind in our evolutionised society that something as extraordinary as that could happen in just six ordinary days. But, you know, I think of it a little differently. The Bible tells me that God is all-powerful and all-knowing. So if that's true, then God could have created the entire universe in just six microseconds. He didn't need six whole long days. So the real question is, why did he take so long? Well, you know what? The Bible gives us an answer to that question too. And we find here in Exodus 20, verse 11... God tells us why he took so long. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. You see, God laid down a pattern for us, for the benefit of mankind. That's why he took so long. Well, as we turn through the pages of this first chapter, we come to a remarkable passage. Here, we read about the first mention of a divine council where the Godhead agrees to make man in our image, it says, in our likeness, and let them rule. You see, we were given a function. That was our mandate to have dominion over all of the creation. But what does it mean to be made in the image of God? Well, I think it means quite a number of things, but the one aspect that I want to focus on this afternoon is um, this issue that 
we were given the ability to make moral choices. Now, why did God do that? Well, the Bible tells us that we were made primarily for relationship, firstly with God himself and then, of course, with each other. But you can't have a meaningful relationship without the ability to choose. Let me illustrate what I mean by that. I could program this computer here to flash up on the screen and say, Mark, I love you, Mark, I love you, Mark, and I have a little border of hearts around the screen, make it look really nice. But would I feel loved by that machine? Of course not, because it would be programmed to do that. There was no volition, there's no choice involved at all. But when my wife says to me, Mark, I love you, ah, that warms my heart. You see, some 35 years ago, she chose to marry me, as I chose to marry her. You know, I've uh, never understood why she made that decision, but I praise God for it. You see, we had to have the ability to choose to love and relate to our Creator or to rebel against Him. Without that choice, our relationship to God would never have been meaningful. The next scripture is rather interesting, and I've shown it here in italics. Genesis 1.27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. Now this is the only verse in Genesis chapter 1 that is poetry. A lot of people say to me, but Genesis is, is poetic, it's uh, allegorical, it's myth, implying, of course, that it's not meant to be taken as a literal account of what actually happened, an historical true account. So it's like when God reaches this point in the creation account, the pinnacle of his creative effort, mankind, he bursts into poetry to describe just how awesome and how magnificent event this is. The rest of Genesis 1 is prose. Magnificent prose, yes, but prose nonetheless. And then we come upon an interesting scripture that says, And to everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. Now this gives us a little glimpse of what that original creation must have been like. You see, animals were not ripping other animals apart for food. There was no bloodshed, there was no suffering in that original perfect created world. In fact, when God looked at all that he had made, he declared it to be very good. And the sense in the Hebrew there is that it could not possibly have been any better. Or an English word we might use is perfect. So let's construct a timeline now of biblical history. And here, right at the beginning, in the very first year, at the beginning of that year, we have the creation week. Now, we all know the rest of the story and the account of how the enemy came in the form of the serpent and deceived Eve. And we read that when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Eve was deceived, but Adam knowingly and deliberately ate of the fruit. You see, this was no trivial issue of just eating a piece of fruit. This was a direct act of disobedience and rebellion against the Creator. And the Bible tells us that it was a sin of Adam that brought death into the world. The, the fall was an unmitigated disaster. How God's heart must have broken. The consequences of sin were profound. The serpent was cursed above all the other animals. The woman's pain in childbirth was greatly increased. Male and female relationships were forever changed. Thorns and thistles sprang up out of the ground. Adam would earn his living through difficulty, hard work and by the sweat of his brow. But most importantly, physical death entered the world. So that once perfect creation was now marred and shattered by man's rebellion. And we read in Romans 8.22... The whole of creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. The fall had cosmic consequences. Not only was man separated from God, but also the animal kingdom itself suffered and so too did the entire physical universe. 
We read in the New Testament passages that confirm the historical account we read in Genesis. Like this one in Romans 5.12, Therefore just as sin entered the world through one man, and that one man of course was Adam, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men. And then we read in Romans 6, the wages of sin is death. And in 1 Corinthians 15, since death came through a man. You see, the Bible is absolutely clear. God did not create suffering and death. Those things are the consequence of man's rebellion, what the Bible calls sin. But you know, that scripture in 1 Corinthians goes on and it says, For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. And some people say to me, you know, it was just a spiritual death. But if that were true, this scripture would make no sense. If Adam's rebellion brought spiritual death only into the world, then Jesus only needed to die spiritually and be resurrected spiritually. But he died physically and his resurrection was a physical resurrection. So let's put another mark now on our timeline. Somewhere after the creation week, the fall took place. Now the Bible doesn't say when, but we presume not very long. And that set in motion inevitable processes of suffering and decay and finally death. And we read that Adam died 930 years after the creation. Then great wickedness spread out over the face of the earth. And we read that the Lord was grieved that he'd made man and his heart was filled with pain. But we know the story how Noah was found to have favour in God's eyes and God said to Noah, I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. So Noah faithfully constructed the ark in accordance with God's instructions And then God brought two of every kind of animal, seven of some, to Noah, and they entered the ark. Now note, Noah didn't have to go out on safari to round them all up. God brought the animals to him. And on the very day that they went into the ark, God closed the door behind them, and we read that all the springs of the great deep burst forth and the floodgates of the heavens were opened. My friends, it was not just a case of 40 days and 40 nights of torrential rain that brought the flood. Look at what the first part of that scripture says. It says the springs of the great deep burst forth. Creationist geologists have built some models of what might have happened based on observations we can make in the present, real science, and on what the scriptures reveal to us. For instance, we know that there are vast subterranean water reserves today called aquifers. The rupturing of such water reserves would have caused high pressure jets of water to rocket into the air, ripping up through the Earth's crust, hurling huge rocks and sediment and then crashing back down, causing massive destruction on the Earth's surface. We know that the Earth's crust consists of vast continental plates called tectonic plates. At the onset of the flood, these plates could have ruptured and uh, these plates, which today move at centimetre per century kind of rates, And by the way, even at such slow rates, significant geological activity takes place, doesn't it? We see volcanoes, earthquakes, tsunamis as a result. But at the onset of the flood, these plates could have been moving relative one to the other, not at centimetres per century kind of rates, but at metres per second, releasing massive quantities of the Earth's magma into huge volcanic eruptions with boulders, superheated steam, rocks, ash, all bursting up into the air, then raining back down onto the surface of the earth, wreaking rather terrible destruction, along with 40 days and 40 nights of torrential rain. The Bible says the waters rose and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. Only Noah and those with him on on the ark survived. The entire surface of the earth was totally devastated by the flood. This was the greatest geological catastrophe to ever occur in the history of the earth. And yet, this is what we often see. Well, you've all seen the same sort of picture, haven't you? The old leaky bathtub idea, a couple of giraffes next sticking out the top. Maybe Mrs Noah hanging out the washing. It's kind of cute, isn't it? But sadly, 
It trivialises the enormity of the event. The Bible tells us that the ark was a huge vessel. It wasn't like that at all. It was somewhere in the order of 140 metres long and we've shown there a semi-trailer next to it for scale. And can you see the people at the end? The ark would have had to have carried somewhere in the order of 16,000 animals. It's been estimated that there have been, ever since the creation of the world, about 8,000 different kinds of animals, the average size of which is about that of a sheep. Now, when I talk about kind, I mean that Noah did not have to have two chihuahuas, two poodles, two Pekingese, two Great Danes, two terriers, two of every of the variety of dogs we see today. He just needed two of dog kind, probably wolf-like animals. A vessel as large as that could carry over 120,000 sheep. The ark was more than big enough for the task and to carry enough supplies and provisions for all of those on the ark, plus Noah, his wife, their three sons and their wives. Interestingly, the ark would have been big enough to carry two of every kind of dinosaur. Now, isn't that an interesting thought? What did happen to the dinosaurs? Secular scientists have observed that there must have been some kind of cataclysmic event in the past that wiped out the population of dinosaurs. Now, they reject any reference to a biblical account of history, and so they've come up with some fairly fantastic ideas about what might have happened. But what does the Bible say? Well, we read that in Genesis chapter 1 that God made all the wild animals according to their kinds, and that happened on day 6. We also read that man was made on day 6. So we can draw a conclusion from that. Logically enough, it says that dinosaurs and man lived together. How interesting. Maybe Fred Flintstone was right after all. And then we read in Genesis chapter 7 that pairs of all creatures that have the breath of life in them came to Noah and entered the ark, from which we can reasonably conclude that two of every kind of dinosaur must have likewise gone onto the ark. And we also read that every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. Only Noah was left and those with him on the ark. So what can we conclude? That all the dinosaurs, not on the ark, must have drowned in the flood. Some time ago I had the privilege of being able to visit the Natural History Museum, part of the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C., in the U.S. And they have a magnificent dinosaur display there. One of the most interesting aspects, though, is a display which shows the dinosaurs in the positions in which they were found. And it's remarkable that many of them are in swimming positions. There's one of a huge creature, an Allosaurus, about the size of a modern elephant, whose body has been twisted and mashed. It's died a very violent death, entirely consistent with being buried by tons of sediment and rock, just like we read in the account of Noah's flood. But you know, it gets even more interesting because in Genesis chapter 8, we read that all the animals and all the creatures came out of the ark, one kind after another. So the next conclusion we can draw is that two of every kind of dinosaur survived the flood. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? Now, in case you're in doubt of that, uh, we have here irrefutable evidence. But speaking of evidence, if something as catastrophic as a global flood had happened, surely there would be some evidence left behind. Even when a minor flood occurs, we know that sediment is left behind and destruction occurs, surely something as grand as a global catastrophic flood must leave some evidence. And not surprisingly, we find on every continent of the earth large-scale sedimentary rock deposits, like the Hawkesbury Sandstone, a formation just west of Sydney. In fact, Sydney is largely built on Hawkesbury Sandstone and it extends many kilometres to the west and a long way to the north. It's a massive deposition. A close-up examination of uh, the sedimentary layers reveals not only are there individual layers here, but also these diagonal lines which is, are called cross-bedding. 
Now, from examining the cross bedding, geologists can learn much about the nature of the water that deposited that sediment. And uh, a geologist at Macquarie University said this, the Hawkesbury sandstone was formed by a wall of water up to 20 metres high and 250 kilometres wide, coming down from the north at enormous speed, delivering tonnes of sand into the Sydney area. Now, folks, think about it. 20 metres high, 250 kilometres wide. That is a staggering cataclysmic event. And that accounts for just the Hawkesbury sandstone. What about the layers below it and the layers above it? You see, everywhere we look, we see evidence of massive global catastrophism. Like here in the walls of the Grand Canyon, we see these arrays of uh, sharply defined layers, layer upon layer. Now, the usual story you'll find in the geology textbooks goes something like this, that uh, a flood comes along and lays down a layer of sediment, and then some years later, another flood comes and lays another layer on top of that, and then some years later, another one, and so on and so forth, over thousands and millions of years to build up all of these layers. But let's do some real observable science. Let's take a look at those layers. If a layer had been laid down like that, then surely there'd be some evidence of elapsed time. For instance, wouldn't we expect to find some vegetation, maybe tree roots or evidence of plant life or animal life, maybe burrows, uh, or, or certainly the next time it rained, we would see signs of erosion. You know, there's a particular boundary between the Coconino sandstone and the Hermit Shale at the Grand Canyon, a boundary which extends for hundreds of kilometres, it's visible, and the time lapse between those two layers is supposedly 10 million years, and yet there is no sign of erosion anywhere throughout it. My friends, what that speaks of is no elapsed time between the laying down of those layers, or at least very little, if not, in fact, simultaneous deposition of them all. That speaks of a global catastrophe because we find that sort of evidence everywhere we look. But it's even more interesting because buried in those sedimentary rock layers, we find the remains of once living creatures, like this beautifully preserved fossil fish. Now, the normal story you would uh, hear in your bi biology textbooks about the formation of a fossil fish goes something like this. A little fish is swimming along in a river or lake. It dies, sinks to the bottom. Some sediment is swept over, covers the fish, sets hard as rock. Over time, there's some uplift and then erosion, and someone finds a fossil. But let's do some observable science. Has anybody ever kept fish? Anyone? Yes. Now, what happens when the fish die? Do they sink to the bottom or do they float to the top? They float to the top, don't they? And in nature, if a fish dies and floats to the top of a river or lake, what happens then? Birds will come and pick on it. Other fish will eat the body. Before long, there's just a few bony remains that will sink to the bottom, and even the crustaceans will consume those. You can do some observable science, my friends. Next time you're going snorkeling or scuba diving, Look down at the ocean floor. Do you see all those dead fish lying there, waiting to become fossils? They're not there, are they? You see, it's actually quite difficult to form a fossil fish. The evidence is that it appears to form very rapidly. Here's a rather interesting example. This is a marine creature called an ichthyosaur. Now, beautifully preserved fossil here, but this is a female ichthyosaur. Can anybody see how I know that this is a female ichthyosaur? Someone suggested it has nice big eyelashes, but no, that's not the answer. Well, some of you have seen it, of course. It's been buried and caught in the very act of giving birth. And there you can see the baby ichthyosaur just emerging from the mother's birth canal. Now, ladies, I've heard of long labours, but not thousands of years, right? This clearly illustrates a spectacular and dramatic sudden event. That creature was dumped on by tons of sediment and uh, it died in the very act of giving birth. So fish fossils really form like this and I'm just going to give you a fairly scientific explanation now so just bear with me. So here's little fish swimming along, um, all happy and uh, no problems and all of a sudden it's dumped upon by tons of sediment and mud and rock and it gets buried and encased inside the layers, and of course it dutifully expires. 
Now, before long, we're going to have the fossil remains of that fish. You see, it all happens very rapidly. But some people say to me, doesn't radioisotope dating of the rocks prove that they are millions of years old? So surely that is evidence for evolution. So let's have a look at this topic quickly of radioisotope dating. It's a little bit like an hourglass. We have a radioactively unstable element called the parent element, which decays at a certain rate and produces what is called the daughter element. Now, if I take a sample of rock and measure the ratio of the parent element to the daughter element, I can then calculate the age of the rock. We should note, by the way, that age is never measured directly. Age is only ever inferred. But let's think about this process. Let's imagine that you had come around the corner of um, your house into the backyard and there under a dripping tap is a bucket partly filled with water. Now, if you knew how much water was in the bucket and how fast the tap was dripping, you could work out how long the bucket had been under the tap, right? Yeah, I'm getting a few cautious nods. Most of you think I'm trying to trick you. Well, actually, you could work out how long the bucket had been under the tap, but you would have to make a number of assumptions. Now, remember, your science is being done in the present. You've just come upon the bucket and the dripping tap. You did not see it placed under the tap. You could work out how long it had been there, but you would have to assume that the bucket was empty when it went under the tap. What if it was partly filled? You'd have to assume that um, whoever had left it there had not turned the tap on hard and then just perhaps left it turned off carelessly, just dripping, and then walked away a matter of seconds before you came around the corner. Maybe there was evaporation. Perhaps the dog had a drink out of the bucket. You know, there are countless many ways in which water can get into and out of the bucket. And the problem is we have no way of determining what the initial conditions were. And it's exactly the same in the case of radioisotope dating. We cannot go back in the past to determine those conditions. Now, you can get any age you like, depending on the assumptions you make. And you know the worst bit? It's impossible to test your assumptions, because to do so, you would have to go back into the past, which, of course, we can't do. Remember, science is based on observable, repeatable experiments, and it works in the present. But all is not lost. What we can do is take some rocks of known age and test a number of different dating methods. For instance, if we took some volcanic rock, rock formed as molten lava hardens, we could uh, measure the age using a method called the potassium-argon method. Now, argon is an inert gas. It will bubble away and uh, escape from molten lava, but it gets captured in the crystalline lattice of the basaltic rock, and uh, it should give us an ability to measure the age of the rock. So here are some examples. Some rock from the lava dome of Mount St. Helens was taken and dated at a radiometric dating laboratory. Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980. Rocks from the lava dome were dated between 350,000 and 2.8 million years old. At the time, the rocks were only, well, they were less than 20 years old. Here from Kilauea in Hawaii, less than 200 years ago, the eruption took place. The rocks were dated anywhere between 0 and 22 million years. And here at Hualalai in Hawaii, about 200 years ago again, and the rocks were dated between 180 million and 3.3 billion years. Folks, if dating rocks of known age gives unreliable results, why should we believe the results we get for rocks of unknown age? And here's another interesting case. This is a lump of Hawkesbury sandstone again, and uh, this particular lump shown up there in the top left-hand corner was found to have uh, embedded within it a piece of wood. Now, the wood was completely encased in the sandstone. The sandstone was dated as 230 million years old, and the wood was dated using carbon-14 dating at 34,000 years. How could something so much younger have been embedded totally in something vastly older than it? Surely different dating methods must give about the same results for things which must be about the same age. And I like this quotation. If a C14 date supports our theories, we put it in the main text. If it does not entirely contradict them, we put it in a footnote. And if it's completely out of date, we just drop it. Now, folks, I'm not having a go at scientists here because uh, I guess I am one. 
But what you see here is the way our belief systems work. And we're all the same. We filter all the information and the data we receive from the world around us in accordance with our beliefs, our worldview. So these guys would have had a research grant, probably from a government or a university. They've sent off a whole bunch of samples for dating. It's a fairly expensive process. And back comes the data, and it scatters all over the place. Now, they have a preconceived idea, in accordance with their beliefs, as to how old they believe the samples should be. So what do you do with all the stuff which doesn't fit? Well, what we do is we rationalise it. They might have thought, well, maybe there were some impurities in the samples. Uh, perhaps the lab equipment was uh, not calibrated correctly. Perhaps the lab technician had afternoon tea in the middle. Whatever, but we don't have enough money to send them all back again to be redone, so what do we do with the data? That's what we do with the data. We cull it in accordance with our belief systems. Folks, can you see how important it is that we build our belief systems on the rock-solid foundation of God's Word, the Bible? Because in this book, we discover a true history of the world. And that true history enables us to interpret the world around us. Well, there are some passages of Scripture which I used to think God put there to help those of us who might suffer with insomnia. You know, the list of all the begats and the ages and all this stuff. But, you know, if you dig into that, you can learn some really interesting things. For instance, when Adam was 130 years old, his son Seth was born. And when Seth was 105 years old, his son Enos was born. And so on, all the way down to Noah. And the Bible tells us in the 600th year of Noah's life, the flood came. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to add all those numbers up. And if you do, you will discover that the flood occurred 1,656 years after creation. So remember that timeline we had? We can now put another mark on it. And here it is. The flood occurred 1,656 years after creation. You know, in the immediate aftermath of the flood, there would have been dramatically changed environmental conditions on the face of the earth. Remember we talked about those volcanic eruptions and all that lava bursting up through the waters covering the earth? That would have had the result of warming up the oceans. Also, volcanic eruptions give vast quantities of ash into the upper atmosphere. In fact, when Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines erupted in 1992, just a moderate-sized one-only volcano, the average temperature of the earth dropped by 0.2 of a degree. So the ash in the upper atmosphere would lead to less light and warmth onto the land masses, so we have cold land mass and warm oceans. Considerable evaporation taking place off the oceans. It all precipitates back down over the cold land masses as ice and snow and sleet. And what we have is the onset of the one and only ice age that there has been, immediately following the flood. Geologists believe that the, the Ice Age probably lasted around five to 700 years. And we read in the book of Job in chapter 38 reference to the waters becoming hard as stone and the surface of the deep being frozen. So these images paint the picture of the aftermath of the flood and the Ice Age which follows. Now evolutionists believe that there were multiple Ice Ages through the vast geological history supposed of the Earth. And there was a conference held a couple of years ago where climatologists got together to try and understand what mechanisms would have led to the onset of multiple ice ages. Now, at the end of their conference, they published their findings in Science Journal. And uh, just in the closing article, this quotation comes, and they say, a final solution still eludes us. Now, that's an elegant scientific way of saying we haven't got a clue. You see, when we look at the world around us today, there is no known mechanism to cause a massive thermal imbalance between the oceans and the land, such as is needed to trigger an ice age. But when we go back to the Word of God, we have a basis for our belief and our understanding of the world around us. Now, folks, just in case you're wondering, I'm not trying to use science to prove the Bible. If I was doing that, it would be like, Elevating science, if I can use that as an example of high technology and science, above God's word. Making science the arbiter or the benchmark. But it's the other way around. We start with God's word and the true history of time that it reveals and use that to interpret the science in the world around us or the observations that we make. 
Now, as we move through this uh, chapter, this um, opening chapters of the book of Genesis, we come upon an interesting account in the first uh, nine verses of Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel. Now, the conditions around this are these. Immediately following the flood, God said to Noah that you are to spread out over the face of the earth. Now, you might think that after such a cataclysmic judgment as the flood, that we would be likely to be obedient. Now, I say we because we're all the same, you know. We have the Adamic nature, don't we? So what did we all do? Did we obediently spread out? No, the Bible tells us that we all gathered together on a plain in a place called Shinar. And there we built a city with a huge tower that was to reach to the heavens. Why? To make a name for ourselves. So God came down and confused the languages of the people. You see, up until that time, only one language had been spoken on the face of the earth. Now let me ask you a question. Who here in the audience today speaks a language other than English? Yeah, hands everywhere. You know, it's not surprising when we hear someone speak in, we can't understand them. We just think, well, they're speaking another language. But try and imagine what it would have been like. You wake up in the morning and have breakfast and you head off to work. Perhaps you're working on the tower that day. You arrive at work and everybody's babbling at you. You would very quickly realise that this was no joke. People genuinely could not communicate. There would be great fear and confusion. And in the midst of it all, you hear someone speaking, you can understand them. You'd go to them and say, what's going on? Very quickly, small groups of common language would form up and they would rapidly flee away from the city. You know, God in his grace, even in judgment, did not divide families. The Bible said that the languages were divided in accordance with families and clans. But as those people spread away from the tower, there would have been, virtually overnight, a loss of technology. Now, I know quite a deal about the design of communication satellites, but if you were to place me in some remote wilderness area and say, OK, Mark, you're on your own, all of that knowledge would be a complete waste. My primary objective would be survival. The very first thing I'd want to do would be find a source of water and uh, then shelter and something to eat. And I can imagine as each of those groups of common language spread out away from Babel, that too would have been their priority. In fact, some of them I can imagine sheltering in caves, maybe fashioning stone tools to improve their ability to, to catch animals. There would have been a significant loss of technology and capability overnight as a result of the Tower of Babel. But you know, as small groups start to reproduce, something else rather interesting happens. Previously, recessive genes, which could not express their characteristics readily into the population group, would be able to do so. And then with changed environmental conditions, those physical characteristics could become locked into those population groups. And I'm speaking here of things like eye shape, nose shape, hair colour and texture. And what about this question of skin colour? There seem to be so many different skin colours in the world today. So how many skin colours are there, do you suppose? So let me ask you a question. Who thinks there would be more than 100 skin colours in the world today? For a show of hands, one or two people. So everybody else must think it's less. So who thinks there would be between 10 and 100 skin colours in the world today? Who thinks there'd be less than 10? Yeah, a few more. Who never puts up their hand if asked a question in an audience? <laughs> <laughs> There's always a few of those. Well, it's fascinating. You know that... Uh, oh, by the way, there's a good-looking bloke up there on the top left, isn't there? <laughs> You know, it's interesting that there is actually only one skin colour. You see, our skin colour is determined by a pigment called melanin. Now, if your genes are programmed to manufacture a lot of melanin on exposure to sunlight, you will have dark skin, dark eyes, dark hair. But if you're like me and your genes are programmed to manufacture very little, then you'll have very fair skin. In fact, I'm not white. If you put a white sheet of paper next to my skin, it's clearly not white. It's really a very light brown colour, slightly pinkish actually because of the blood vessels that are close under the surface of the skin. But the amount of genetic information to cause that kind of variation is extremely tiny. And interestingly enough, if 
you had mid-brown parents, you can actually produce the whole range of skin colours in just one generation. And here is an amazing example. These two beautiful little twin girls, born just a few years ago, one on the left there is, uh, is what we would call white, the one on the right we would call black, but of course she's just a chocolatey brown colour. Their parents were mid-brown, and here they have these twin girls, just showing how that variation can take place and so rapidly. Now we understand from the science of genetics how this happens today. But the variation in genetic information to produce those different skin colours is absolutely tiny. And the same goes with the other physical characteristics which distinguish the different, shall I say, ethnic groups rather than race. You see, the amount of genetic variation within a single people group is something like 15 times greater than the amount of genetic variation between people groups. There is no basis for this notion of race. The Bible tells us plainly that we are all descended from Adam and Eve. In that sense, we are all related one to the other. Unfortunately, though, racism has been fuelled by evolutionary belief. Now, I'm not saying that evolutionists are racists, but this quotation from Stephen Jay Gould is very telling. Biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1850, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolutionary theory. Now, folks, in the, the period of the Ice Age, all of that water which evaporated out of the oceans and deposited it down as ice and snow would have led to a lowering of the ocean levels. And the possibility, therefore, of forming land bridges across the Bering Straits between what is now Russia and Alaska and through the Indonesian archipelagos down to Australia. So the migration of the animals post the flood and of mankind post Babel could have followed paths similar to what we show here. Well, we can now put another mark on our timeline of biblical history. And here in, uh, we find that the Bible tells us that the Tower of Babel occurred in the days of Peleg. And he lived between 1,757 and 1,966 years after the, the uh, creation. External documents to the Bible suggest it was early in Peleg's life, so I've shown that date in italics. But the Bible also reveals to us that Abraham was born in the year 2008 after creation. Now, my friends, the point of this slide is to show you that in the biblical account, the true account of history, there is no room for the supposed millions and millions of years of biblical history. There's only about 2,000 years from the creation to Abraham, about 2,000 years from Abraham to Jesus and about 2,000 years from Jesus to the present. That gives around 6,000 years in total. 6,000 years. What a staggering claim the Bible makes about the history of the world. Staggering in the context of our evolutionised society. But surely, if this was true, there must be evidence to support it. And guess what there is? And let me share with you just a couple of those very quickly. For instance, our atmosphere consists of a number of different gases. One of them is helium. It's the gas people put in party balloons, and if you get a mouthful, it makes your voice sound funny, you know, all that stuff. Now, helium is added into the atmosphere regularly by the radioactive decay processes that take place in the Earth's crust. So there's a rate at which helium is being constantly added. Some of it, however, escapes from the Earth's atmosphere. And if you watch carefully, you'll see the escape. There he goes. So there is a net rate of accumulation of helium in the Earth's atmosphere. So knowing how much it's accumulating or what, what rate it's accumulating at and how much is there now, we could determine how long it would have taken for all that helium to accumulate in the atmosphere of the Earth. And it turns out it would have been no more than two million years. Now, folks, that is way, way too short for the evolutionary time scale. But just like the bucket of water analogy before, we don't know the initial conditions of the atmosphere and how much helium was there right at the beginning. So it's not inconsistent with the biblical record. Ladies, some of you might be wearing diamonds on your fingers today. Diamonds are the hardest naturally occurring form of carbon. It's impossible to get impurities from outside of a diamond into it through natural processes. They are assumed to be between one and three billion years old. Now, a sample of 12 diamonds were taken by the 
Rage Group. That's uh, a group that was formed in the US some years ago. Um, it was uh, to do with the study of radioactivity in the age of the Earth. And those diamonds were measured for the presence of carbon-14. Now, the significance of carbon-14 is this. The half-life is only around 5,700 years. In 20 half-lives, that, by the way, means that after one half-life, a half of the initial concentration is all that is left. After another half-life, you have yet another half, or in other words, a quarter of the original. So after 20 half-lives, which is about 115,000 years, there would be less than one millionth of the original quantity of carbon-14 left. A lump of carbon-14 as massive as the Earth would completely decay away in less than one million years. So clearly, diamonds, which must be at least a billion years old, according to the evolutionary timescales, will not have any carbon-14 in them. But what is fascinating is every single sample showed significant quantities of carbon-14 illustrating without doubt that the diamonds are not billions of years old, but indeed only a matter of thousands. We had an article recently in our Creation magazine, and we called it Diamonds, a Creationist's Best Friend. Another interesting example is a certain amount of mud on the ocean floor. The rivers dump about 20 billion tonnes of mud annually onto the ocean floor. So knowing how much is there and the rate at which it's accumulating, we could calculate how long it would have taken and you know what? We find that it would all have accumulated in less than 12 million years. That, folks, is way too short for the evolutionary time scale. Way too short because the oceans are supposed to be billions of years old. But hang on a minute, it's too long for the biblical time scale. So can anybody think of some mechanism in the past which might have dumped billions of tonnes of mud onto the ocean floor? You got it. The flood, of course. You know, there are hundreds of ways that we can measure the age of the Earth. More than 90% of these processes give an age that is much less than the assumed billions of years. Even the old age problem of uh, distant starlight has now been addressed by some exciting new developments in creationist cosmology. So even that issue is now no longer an obstacle to believing in what the Bible plainly says. But what about those dinosaurs we talked about earlier? A scientist called Mary Schweitzer was examining a, a Tyrannosaurus rex bone and she found in it a red blood cell. She was absolutely staggered and said to the lab technician, it's exactly like looking at a slice of modern bone, but of course I couldn't believe it. I said to the lab technician, the bones after all are 65 million years old, how could blood cells survive that long? Well folks, they can't. Observable science was telling her that she had the wrong belief system. Some years later, she published again. This time, she was examining the femur of a Tyrannosaurus rex, the thigh bone. And it was found to contain soft tissue, flexible, resilient. When it was stretched, it returned to its original shape. It had a fresh look about it. There were blood vessels in it. It was staggering. They cut a thin slice of the bone and dissolved the bone away to look at what tissue remains. And she said, as the fossil dissolved, transparent vessels were left behind. It was totally shocking. I didn't believe it until we had done it 17 times. Can you see the power of observable, repeatable experiments? Real science. You know, it's interesting that in so many of the cultures and civilizations of the world today, there are stories about encounters between men and huge beasts, which we normally call dragons, like the account of St George and the dragon, and this one from Ireland just 1,100 years ago. An Irish writer recorded an encounter with a large beast with iron nails in its tail. Now, sometimes the drawings of these dragons are rather fanciful. It's a bit like the story of the fisherman and the one that got away. You know how it gets better every time it's told. But that description fits an animal that we would recognise today as a stegosaurus. And here's some artwork from uh, Aboriginal art showing a plesiosaur. It appears that the animal has eaten one of the tribe's people. They're obviously trying to rescue him. Doubtless were unsuccessful. But the Aboriginal people would presumably have only drawn that animal if they had seen it. And here, on a temple in Angkor in Cambodia, an 800-year-old temple recently reclaimed from the jungle. One of the stone carvings shows this animal with bony plates on its back. You know, 800 years ago, there were no paleontologists around to tell those people that the animal they were carving was actually extinct. I'll let you think about that. You see, it must have been a recognisable animal. 
we would see it today as a stegosaurus. And just 500 years ago, in Carlisle Cathedral, Bishop Bell's tomb has a brass engraving around it which shows images of common animals, cat, fish, dog, so on. And there in the middle of it are these two creatures with long necks, long tails with bony protrusions on their tails, what we would recognise today as dinosaurs. You see, I think we can make a very strong case that the dinosaurs of history are actually the very same as the dragons of legend. But folks, why does all this stuff matter? So often I hear people say to me, but isn't this just a side issue? Aren't we as Christians called to reach out to the lost, to evangelise, to share the gospel? Well, let me try to explain why I believe this is such a profoundly important issue. You see, the evolutionary account of history has death and struggle and suffering as the agency by which mankind has been created. This clearly places death before Adam. The Bible's account, however, is very different. It says that death came into the world because of man's actions, and that only a few thousand years ago. So we have a picture of three different worlds in the Bible. Firstly, there was that original perfect creation that we read about in the first chapters of Genesis. But then we read that there has come an intrusion of death and disease and suffering into that perfect creation. That intrusion came about because of man's disobedience, man's rebellion. Now, if we allow belief in the millions and millions of years to enter into our understanding of of past history and time, then it's like doing this. We take that top left-hand corner out of the picture. But can you see what's happened? Now, death, disease and suffering are an integral part of the world which God must have created. That means, folks, that when something bad happens, like a child dies of cancer or a natural disaster kills many, many innocent people, then we would be justified in shaking our fists at God and saying, why did you do that? But you see, it's not like that at all, is it? The Bible reveals God as loving, compassionate, slow to anger. He's not capricious. He's not malevolent and intent on harming us. You see, the millions and millions of years idea corrupts our concept of God. My friends, we need to put that top left-hand corner back into our understanding, and that is what we find in the opening chapters of the book of Genesis. So the very gospel message itself is like this. Right at the beginning, we read there was once a perfect creation. God and man were in perfect relationship with each other. There was no disease, no suffering, and no death. But then we rebelled. And that act of rebellion brought immediate separation between God and man and ushered in disease and suffering and death into the world. But praise God, he loves us so much that he came in human form as the man Jesus And he paid the price for our sin, which is death. Why? Because right back at the beginning, Adam brought death into the world. And Jesus gave his life for us on the cross to pay the price that we could not pay. But then we read that he rose again, which proves that Jesus is the Son of God. And that gives a hope for every believer for the future. But my friends, if we leave it at that, then nothing happens. You see, when each and every one of us individually places our confidence and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we can experience what the Bible calls the new birth. And if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. My friends, that means there's nothing in your past that the cross cannot atone for. And in fact, it's not about doing things at all to win God's favour. It's about that step of faith placing our belief in who Jesus is. And the new birth is when God gives us the gift of his Holy Spirit who restores relationship once again. So now we have the incredible privilege of having God's own Holy Spirit within our hearts, walking with us daily. What an amazing fact and what an amazing story. What an incredible redemption God has wrought for us. And the deposit of the Holy Spirit in our lives guarantees our inheritance for all of eternity. So my friends, I hope you can see that the true history of time 
that reveals what actually happened at the beginning is like a foundation stone to the very gospel message itself. That is why this issue is so profoundly important for the church today. So let me just conclude by praising God for the beauty of his creation, but above all, thanking him for the wonders of his most amazing grace. Thank you. 